When something is described as objective, it means that there is a truth of the matter about it, independent of what anyone thinks, feels, or believes on the topic. So, for example, independent of what anyone thinks, the Earth is the third planet from the Sun. Atoms of lithium contain three protons. One plus two equals three, and the triple alpha process for carbon fusion requires three nuclei of helium. Now, standing apart from any of that are claims such as the music of Mozart is more enjoyable than that of Beethoven, or a good seafood buffet is preferable to any Michelin star formal dining experience, and no matter how good Teslas get, the driving experience will never match that of an Australian Holden Commodore. All of those claims are subjective. There exists a component of the claim that depends entirely on what an individual person believes, thinks or feels, what their personal perceptions are. Do oysters taste nice? Some will wretch at the thought, others like myself have never found the number of oysters to ever be sufficient. They're delicious. Or are they actually delicious? Are they actually delicious to me or in some objective sense? Well, here is where we get into that slightly tricky distinction between what John Searle identified as the two senses of objectivity versus subjectivity. On the one hand, we have this notion of objectivity being as I described, about facts of the matter, where the Earth is, what particular numbers add up to, how many protons there may be in a given atomic nucleus. The answers to these matters are independent of people's thoughts. They are out there in the world, so to speak. But other things are subject to personal taste. The deliciousness of oysters, a preference for one style of music over another. This is called the epistemological distinction between subjectivity and objectivity. But now there's a curiosity that appears, because if we just focus for a moment on my claim that oysters are delicious, well, that is an objective claim an objective fact about me, an objective claim about my subjective experience, an objective claim about my subjectivity. My subjectivity is in a sense me, it is my experience, it exists independent of what I think about it. I am just presented with deliciousness of oyster each time I pop one into my mouth, as I am repulsed by the odour of certain French cheeses. These are objective facts about me and my preferences. But it seems like my preferences are not out there in the world of objects, but rather they're in my mind. In other words, there is a world of objects out there, the objective world. And there is also a world of subjects, the subjective world, namely the contents of people's minds. Their conscious experience of the world is a world of subjectivity. And there are true and false claims we can make about that subjective world of experience. What this means is that we have an epistemological distinction to make between these two words, objective and subjective. Namely, the former, objective, are about claims that could be true or false, right or wrong, independent of anyone's preferences. And the latter, subjective claims, are literally your preferences. There is not a single strict right or wrong universally for everyone. Are oysters delicious? Well, there is no objective answer that is true independent of the thoughts of a mind and experiences of a person. You have to ask an individual. But then there is an ontological distinction too. The ontological distinction is that there is a world of objects and a world of subjects. Never mind the claims about planets and numbers and protons. Those things are objects out there in the world. And then there are people's preferences, tastes, experiences, their internal sensation of blue when they look at the sky and so on. That is a subjective world. And we can make true or false claims about it. I find oysters delicious is a claim about my ontologically subjective world. And it is a factual claim which could be true or false. I could be lying after all. But that claim therefore becomes epistemologically objective. It's true or false. And it's about my subjectivity. So sometimes we can be entirely objective about our subjectivity. If something is subjective, it does not mean it is not truthful or factual, but it can mean it is about a particular individual. This distinction of objective and subjective 
in John Searle's sense, is actually just a limiting case of Karl Popper's three worlds that he distinguished. And I'm going to pretty much pass over it with very little comment. Popper's worlds include, well, world one, that are about the world of objects that I've already mentioned, planets, protons, pi, both kinds of pi, the number and the lemon meringue or the meat kind. This is the ontological objective world. World two for Popper is the subjective world of mental processes. So our experience of stuff, John Searle's world of ontological subjectivity. This is the ontologically subjective world, world two. And world three is the world of ideas and theories and explanations. The relationships we can write down or articulate about world one and world two, mainly world one. This is where the theory of planetary orbits is to be found. The theory itself is not an object. It's not like the orbit itself. There is the reality of the planet and its orbit, world one. And then there is the theory of, or the explanation of, or our knowledge about the orbit. World 3. World 3 matches World 1 with more or less error and we expect it to improve over time as our explanations do as we correct errors. When we look at a planet moving across the sky through a telescope, we are having an experience of the planet. That's World 2. Now to what extent World 3, our theories and explanations, affect World 2, our experiences, well, let's save that for another time. But those are Popper's worlds, so in a sense, he got there before Searle, and like I say, I'm going to pass over it without any more comment.